I think I got that chatting. We're good. Testing. Hey. Hello? Yes. Okay, good. The mic works. Now we need his mic up here. <laughs> I'm a funny guy. Funny how. So why are we here? So um, it's interesting. Um, I've uh, I've had this kind of um, uh, Gene and I have collaborated quite a bit over the years. And about two years ago, I went to Gene and I, I saw this these two fields that were so common that it didn't seem that we they were meeting at the same places and, and, and sharing information because they weren't showing up at the same conferences and. And I, I said, Gene, we need to run this super conference, you know, someday. And we, every year we'd talk about, like, let's do it this year. And then, of course, life gets in the way. And then I saw that um, the organizers here had, you know, had uh, Richard Cook here on K Keynote One and Mike Roth. And, and I was like, Gene, we have to go. <laughs> and now we have to beg the organizers to somehow let us do a panel to just start this combined conversation. And the reason this is important is... These two gentlemen have influenced our, this thing we call DevOps, whether you know it or not. Um, John Ospar in about 2009 wrote a book, or he, the book was released, I believe, in 2009, called Web Operations. And, it was a, and it's still a very relevant book today, so I actually highly recommend it. And one of the chapters was uh, Richard's chapter on why complex systems fail. And it was great because a lot of people use that and we think about complexity a certain way. And then a few years um, later, uh, or later, but I guess about three or four years ago, Gene calls me and says, you have to read this book. You, and when Gene tells you you have to read a book, you drop everything and you read the book. Um, and he said it was, it was Toyota Kata. And, and I just, it, it blew my mind. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I just, to me, it, it, it's so influential. And you saw Mike's thing. So, so I thought, could we have a panel where we can try to see what the common things are? So both of you have influenced DevOps. You know, Lean in general has certainly influenced DevOps. How we think about supply chain, how we think about flow, even our continuous delivery pipeline. A lot of that stuff comes from just Toyota, really, honestly. And then complexity is an interesting conversation that just keeps, continues and continues. Um, some of you might have read Sidney Decker's works. Um, you know, I'll say one last thing before we get started. They asked Adrian Krakow one time, um, how, he was the architect of Netflix, and they said, you know, what did you, you know, how did you do that? It's such an amazing architect. And he said, oh, it was quite simple. I had two books. One book was Sidney Decker's Drift and Failure, and I gave it to operations, and I took Mike, uh, Mike Nygaard's, released it, and gave it to the DevOps. But that's, the safety thing is a big part of our culture. So, um, I think the first thing is this concept of uncertainty. Certainty and uncertainty, right? And I think that as classic IT people, we've been kind of like trained. Our kata has actually been the certainty that we know that we can solve a problem by looking at this. Or we know that if we take this steps or we think we can imagine that we actually see in our head the whole system of the infrastructure that might be thousands or millions of servers. So Gene was telling me yesterday, he had kind of his own like epiphany yesterday about um, certainty versus uncertainty on your brilliant slide where you hid the below the line. So Gene, you want to go ahead and just... Oh yeah, for, for, for those of you, um, you know, if uh, you remember uh, Richard Cook uh, presenting, Dr. Cook presenting the Probably everything Richard. below the line is actually imaginary and only in our heads. <laughs> and I was saying that to Mike Rother and my, my jaw hit the floor. I think I stiffened up. I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> in fact, and then I'm embarrassed to admit that I spent uh, 30 minutes, uh, you know, feebly arguing the case. Um, you know that oh, no, this it can't be real. I'm How about if it's like a Haskell implementation yeah. written in pure mathematics? You know, it was like can't you make certain assertions about the correctness of the code? And you know, eventually I did you know capitulate. You know, I was like, no, you know what? Uh, any place where you can make those assertions is actually such a small component of the system. You know that it uh, you know really you know your your assertion is absolutely correct, and that it is a. Uh, I actually described it as the feeling you get when you read something like Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Uh, there's a special passage where like, he's arguing about the 
notional quality. And it was really a, a profound moment. So uh, thank you for helping me see the light. Um, and uh, the joke that I was uh, telling John, I was like, when, did, when John asked me, when did I have that aha moment? I said it was yesterday. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, and so uh, Dr. Cook is clearly an expert in complexity and complexity theory. But I'm going to skip right to Mike because in Toyota Kata, I think that was really interesting. A lot of people look at lean and they think it's kind of a deterministic. And, and I'm reading in your book about the gray zone. And so you have some thoughts about certainty. I mean, you did, you know, most of it you talked about in the last presentation. Right, but right, right. What? Um, I, you know, probably I was reacting to that feature of the lean community, uh, that sort of certainty. Uh, what would Toyota do? Uh, people implementing things. That's a word that's very common. Let's implement that. Um, uh, but to be fair, I think I was also, maybe as I got older, recognizing this false sense of certainty in myself. Uh, maybe I'm just atoning at this point. <laughs> um, but I think what you said, you know, the, the pendulum swings. We go from one idea, oh, that didn't work, so we go to the next idea, and we throw out the last idea, and suddenly someone else is the hero. Yet all of these ideas have good things that we should hang on to. Right? So when you said um, seeing the solution in your head, I think that's okay if you're not, if you're still open to testing it, right? So um, I would hesitate to throw that out. So if you guys are good at that, then uh, more power to you. But if you can temper that with, okay, now that's the idea in my head, which is born out of my library of experiences over my lifetime, now. Well, how do I test this? What's my first step? You know, how do I, and, and um, we were talking about Kiyoshi Suzaki, who's an old, er, sort of early lean guru, if you will, wrote a book called The New Manufacturing Challenge. He was a Buddhist. And he said, the answer is there in the darkness waiting for you. You only have to meet it halfway. You can't sit here and wait for it. You can't sit here and come up with an idea and think that's it. You have to do something and move toward the solution, but it will meet you halfway. Don't worry. You'll f it'll kind of manifest itself as you move forward. And then he added a comma and said, but it may not be the solution you envisioned originally. And if you're not open to that, you will not see the elegant solution. So have an idea. Cool to be able to envision that, but temper that with the ability to say, ah, there's another way, as you discovered along the way. So I think uncertainty and certainty you know, work together almost in that sense. So actually, just one, one reflection I had. I mean, so uh, it was such a treat to hear Mike Rother again. I took his uh, training, I think it was in 2011, and it was like one of the key moments uh, as we were writing the Phoenix Project to you know, really kind of understand, you know, one, the, the visceral parts of uh, manufacturing and, and flow, and then, and then two, the whole notion of you know, what the improvement cut is all about and you know, what I would call next generation leadership. These are the, what we would expect from any uh, leader, um, you know, certainly hopefully 10 years from now. But what, what, I, uh, uh, what I found so hopeful uh, that now listening to um, you know, your training again is so much of this has become more mainstream. You know, we have in our community, we have things like the lean startup, right? The notion that you know, uh, you know, the only way you can tell what the customer wants is by presenting them with you know, offerings, right? Then they will tell you what they want not to work. You know, the notion of creating minimum viable product. I mean, I think that is all um, now such a, I wouldn't say a given, but uh, you know, it, does, it is not an alien concept to us. And so, so much of what you're teaching, you know, I think this is a community that probably better than most is ready to uh, not only uh, understand, but actually put into practice. So, so, so um, I, whenever I feel I'm going down the certainty path and I need my Zen uncertainty guru, I go, try to get uh, Richard on a, on a hangout. Uh, not, not perhaps the nicest thing that ever has been said about me. But, but, uh, but, but you have, yeah. like, cause you, but you deal with like, you know, like shuttle disaster crashes and people dying. And so why is it so important to, um, to, to really embrace uncertainty? Or am I asking the question the right way, I guess? I, I, I think that, that we live in worlds where we have irreducible uncertainty. We cannot, we, we try, we struggle, we, we use all sorts of tools and techniques uh, to try and um, sort of rein in the uncertainty. But we cannot eliminate it. And, and we're very suspicious in general of people who say that they have done that. If someone looks at us and says there's no uncertainty about this or this always works or anything like that, 
our experience tells us that those per people are usually either misinformed or selling something. And um, so I think uncertainty is, is very much part of our world. Um, I think the ways that we approach uncertainty depend a great deal upon something that um, Mike was talking about, which is this idea of the blast radius in the experiment. Um, and, and I think that's a very, and, and he went past it very quickly, but I, I wanted to stop and, and, and have everybody sit down and take a moment and just think about that, um, which I'd like you to do now. Um, See you in 20 minutes. <laughs> the, the idea of doing experiments is a very attractive one, and the idea of learning through experience via experiment is, is also a very attractive one. But the way that Mike couched it was very careful about the nature of the consequences of doing experiments in certain circumstances. And clearly, this plays in, uh, uncertainty plays into this, because rarely do we know with any degree of precision what the blast radius is. <laughs> and we may, we may have had a bunch of events where the blast radius was small and you know, it was a and then uh, we get into something. And, and I, I can't tell you how many times we see this as some of the events that we're gonna describe in, in the upcoming Stellar Report have this quality of people who were proceeding along believing that they were in one sort of realm and discovering that they were in fact in another one. They believed that they were in a world where the activities that they were undertaking had certain potential consequences, but the shape of that envelope was pretty well understood for them. But then they, the actual experience revealed to them that the shape of that envelope was much wider, much bigger than they had previously thought. And the realization, unfortunately, is, uh, comes with the experiment. That is, the experiment changes your idea of what the blast radius is. And sometimes that can be very profound. Um, it can be a, it can be a, um, uh, a career ending experiment. <laughs> it can be a company ending experiment. And, I, the discussions we had yesterday certainly tell us that that's a really important issue. And, and the difficulty that we face in, in our world is that we're very often, those of you who are working with live systems, are not working in a hypothetical world, you're working in a real world. They're live systems, and you're working on stuff that's going into production, and every deploy is a kind of experiment the blast radius of which is only uncertainly known. And so you have to build up a uh, repertoire of responses that you will be able to put in place. And you do some things about this. By the way, uh, you, you already know all this, so this is not news, but when you, if you make a change, those of you who deploy frequently, those of you who make a, a change, there are lots of changes where you will you know, you'll run through your tests and you'll do, you'll do some pro forma code review with the guy who's, get, you know, with the hangover in the next uh, office or the next cubicle. And of course that person always agrees. And um, then, you know, you'll go off and do it. Well, you do it because the consequences of changing this particular line of CSS is probably not all that great. All of a sudden, you know, this left justified field is a right justified field and looks a little weird, but that's not a big deal. On the other hand, if, if, if you're working with somebody and, and they're new in the business and, and they say to you, um, yeah, I'm gonna just do this, I wanna run this past you just a moment, and they ask you to do a code review and you look at it and they're adding another couple of columns to the database, you're going, mm, tell me more about what it is that you're trying to do here. Or Hold you, my beer. Yeah, I got exactly. <laughs> and, and so the problem, of course, is that not all changes change. Some changes are big and have tremendous potential for, for consequences, and some are small. And, and we're not always good about telling which is which. But one of the things that you're very cautious about is things that are going, that you see as having big uh, possibility of propagation out into the world in a damaging way, you're very, very cautious and conservative with, and others you're very much less so. The point here is that you live in a trade off space. And you're constantly trying to locate where you should be in that trade-off space. Go fast, go slow. Invest more time, 
invest less time and get more velocity. And you're, you're moving for all, uh, at all times inside this trade-off space. It's, now, some people will come to you and say, by corporate policy, your point in the trade-off space is here, and you must stay here. That stuff always breaks down. It doesn't work. So for us, it, I think the uncertainty plays into a question of how do you know, and, and I don't have any answers, sorry, I don't have any answers here. I, in fact, my goal is to study your community to understand these things more generally so that we can apply it in other places. Um, how do you know where you are in that trade-off space, and how do you make decisions about how you should move? What influences the decisions that you are making? What plays on that? Your assessment of how important the thing is, certainly. Your, your assessment of how big an impact it can have, certainly. Your, your judgment about what the opportunity is that's going to be lost because the world is changing. Those are all things that play into this. And, and so to say that you're permeated with uncertainty is absolutely true, but it's not that you're not aware of that. You're dealing with that on a moment-by-moment uh, a -moment basis. And, and I, I very much like Mike's idea about, about understanding these things as experiments because they are experiments. Whether or not you imagine them to be, there you're experimenting with your systems. But there are experiments where you put on a pair of safety glasses and uh, you know, get rid of the flammables around. And then there are experiments where you build a bunker three miles away and uh, <laughs> you know, lay out the cables to do the detonation. And, and you have to be able to tell which of those you are doing. And I would guess that in your ordinary life that you sometimes don't know. And, and that can lead you into problems. Yeah, I mean, you know, just Knight Capital is a great example of- Knight of Capital always Knight, if you have Knight Capital is literally, a, a, I mean, I'm gonna give the, the Richard would get mad at me version of it, but, um, you know, it was, it was, you can read the SEC file, and it was a high-frequency trading company, did dark trading pool stuff, um, a system administrator updated seven of eight systems manually. The eight system created an algorithmic trading algorithm that lost $425 million in basically 45 minutes, and they were literally, the company was out of business in 24 hours. Um, but, Mike, I wanted to go to this whole Andon Court thing, mm. because the Andon Court has become a metaphor for DevOps. Um, and because we, w w the way we see it is in the break the build, uh, you know, make sure your tests will stop and the, the create the red gate that goes back and you have to fix it and, and, and over time. So um, the metaphor becomes that it becomes this learning opportunity. And in your Toyota Kata book, you talked about the, there, was a, um, there was a moment when one of the, the factories was pulling the Andon cord like a thousand times a shift and they went down to 800 times. And, and you know, they, I always say people would be like, in Western culture, be like, yeah, with 200 less defects per mm -hmm. shift. And like, and you're saying that the plant manager got everybody in the room and said, you know, Houston, we've got a problem, you know, and, and, and why, why, why is it so important? Uh, why is that notion of that, that kind of and accord and, and like embracing, and, and I'll say one last thing, you even said a s scenario where when somebody pulled and on cord, no matter, before the manager even knew what happened, they'd thank the person. I, yeah, that happened a fair bit, you know, I mean, particularly with new or when they were working in the United States trying to uh, uh, acclimatize Westerners to their approach, you know, they would say thank you. Someone probably came up with that idea and put it in a memo or something in Japan. A good idea, you yeah. know. Thanks for pulling that. Um, and, and I think it needs to be said that they want to get the line running again. You know, it's not a happy, happy, touchy-feely place. It's like, we really want to get this line running again, but we also don't want to send this defect or this problem down the line. And also, this problem is an opportunity to identify a, a problem in our, our system, right? But at the same time, they're just like General Motors, Ford. They want to make cars. They want to sell cars. And if you don't build them, you can't do that. So I haven't thought about the end on court in a long time. I mean, that goes back to sort of, you know, looking at the artifacts era of my life. Um, I, I don't know. So, that's you know, above the line, or below the line. Yeah. That's the artifact. Right. What, what is the, what's above the line that led to yeah. learning? I mean, you were talking a minute ago about experiments. Um, I'm beginning to adopt an attitude in my life, thanks to this work, that every step is an experiment. 
you know, sounds kind of scary, but you literally walk down the sidewalk and it's like everything in front of you is a probability. Some of them are very high, you know, uh, and, and how liberating that is. Uh, and I wish I'd have realized that earlier in my life. But I, I, then here's the place. So I think the thing about the NR card has become pervasive. Like even if you look at Netflix, right. Netflix has this chaos monkey, right? And most people are probably, who, who, who hasn't heard of the chaos monkey? Okay, there you go. Or are people afraid to raise their hand. But um, it, it's an idea where it is a form of experiment, but it is at, at scale. Right. And this idea of like just breaking things well, um, and to learn. I mean, because yeah. it was always about learning. What I want right. to say real quick, though, is, is, is uh, I don't know if we can understand it with our mindset. I think we view the world through a certain mindset. And I'm just trying to say that as I hit or approach 60, my mindset has for some reason shifted a little bit and I'm starting to see every step as in, in life as an experiment and that prepares me to use the Andon chord to view every step as an experiment that has a probability associated with it and something could happen and once I view it that way and once I begin to enjoy that, then the Andon chord is almost natural. It's like, okay, if, if I enjoy the fact that everything is an experiment, every step is an experiment, nothing is 100% waterproof guaranteed, right? Then it's a short step to, well, I need some way to find out if I need to adjust. Earlier, <coughs> faster, cheaper. Sure, sure, and eventually that will lead you to perhaps a different solution than the end on cord. But, but, but oh, go ahead, demur. Yeah, 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 yeah. There we go, boys. <laughs> yeah. Rumble, well, please. Well, they say the world, they don't, they, I, I, I know not necessarily you, but if I mention the end on court in front of John or Sidney Decker, boy, I, I have to duck because I get a, yeah. they, they swing at me. Yeah, Sidney's a pilot and, and uh, I'm, a, uh, I'm an anesthesiologist and for both of us, the saying takeoffs are optional and landings are essential is true. Um, and, and I think that, that the difficulty with, with uh, sort of stark uh, ideas like a chord, uh, a, a stop the production sequence, uh, is that... By the way, uh, it doesn't stop, it just calls. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, 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 and the, the general idea about, about um, the nature of alerting and changing um, uh, activities um, tends to reduce the significance of those activities to something that is manageable afterwards. But there are a lot of things where we take actions, uh, make decisions that have unretrievable consequences. Okay. And so if you cannot go back or fix it, it's a big deal. Uh, if I put you to sleep and you have a difficult airway and I can't manage that airway, you'll, you will surely die. Okay? I, if, if, I, if I do that in a, and I don't mean to be dramatic here, this is not very likely, um, but if, if, if there are consequences of our decisions, not, not all decisions are tiny incremental things that have low value. Some decisions are bet the shop decisions. Some decisions are bet the company decisions. Some decisions are bet your life decisions. Life choices that you make, you know, who you are going to uh, marry, uh, um, you know, where you are going to live, how you're going to respond to um, injustice. Those are life decisions that have real consequences for you and for others. And there is a, there, so I, I want you to think not only about this idea that I could take each one of the things that is happening and somehow make alterations in it to fix what's going on, but also to think about the kinds of large consequences that flow from the decisions that you make. And to be able to, uh, the, 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 the underlying principle of, of continuous deployment and co um, continuous delivery has been to try and reduce the scale and size of decisions and effects small enough so that, the to that we're able to manage all those consequences that we can handle those sorts of things. But I will tell you that you make many decisions and that have consequences that are way larger than you can recover from uh, and you have to know when you are doing that and approach that in a thoughtful way. So, so this is good. I mean, this it takes us away from the and on court as a solution. I, I don't think what you're saying negates the idea that we don't know. If you put someone under with anesthesia or I'm bolting apart onto a car, in both cases, we have a prediction uh, and a probability. 
Um, but the ramifications, if the part doesn't fit or is cross-threaded, I can fix that within a minute. Uh, if I have a restricted airway, you can't fix that in a minute. So these, the mechanisms you come up with to deal with that uncertainty would vary. And that's where I think when we were looking at the artifacts and saying and on cord, toy dies, and on cord, we're going to do an and on cord, we should do an and on cord everywhere. And you hear people in healthcare who are doing a lot of lean stuff, how can we do and on or how can we do combine in healthcare? It's like wrong question. Yes. Um, but I mean, I think what is obvious. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I, I mean, what, uh, it's, it's so intriguing to me that you, that, uh, you grumble when you hear this because in my mind, right, uh, the, the, the behavior, the, the, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, is, is, you know, when someone has a problem, they can get the help they need, whether it's to resume production or, you know, I need, uh, I'm, I'm missing a, a kit and uh, the, the patient's heart, you know, uh, chest is open, you know, uh, to empower, in our work, it sounds like, you know, if, uh, yeah, someone's right. breaking an automated test, I need help, yeah, uh, we have a step one outage. I need a peer review before mm. I get into production. Mm. Um, mm. To support the line worker, <laughs> to support the person doing the work, my Richard Cook grunt. does not want no, people to get help. Mm. <laughs> mm. Look, yeah. um, one, of the, one of the great problems that exists, I think, for us when we're dealing with this is that, that there is a difference between work as imagined and work as experienced. And our imaginations about work very often are pristine and logical and organized and so on. And when you come you down to the do a deployment. Uh, <laughs> and when you come down to the sharp end, the world is filled with snafus and things that may, don't work well and, and those are my deployments. Bubble gum and, and and duct tape and stuff like that. And and very often we and for instance the stop the line kind of idea has had had some popularity in healthcare briefly. Uh, until nothing happened, you know. I mean, literally nothing happened. The line was stopped and it never got restarted, um, which is a really um, shitty way to deliver health care, okay? You can't actually stop most of these processes. Somebody who's on a ventilator in an ICU, that's not something you can change by, by force of will. So, but the point here is that, that it, and this is, I think, this would go much to what you're talking about in the, and, and one of the sort of unspoken messages of, of the Kata kind of idea is that solutions to problems which are manufactured at levels quite distant from the sharp end of practice tend to misunderstand what the real pressures and dilemmas are in this world. And they fit very poorly with what's happening down here. So, we, you know, we get the memos from up high or we get the tools that are sent down to us or all the rest of that stuff. And when we look at that, we go, well, that's very nice. It's clear from this that you have no idea what I do down here. So I'm going to set that to the side and keep working. And the double bind that we end up in that, in that situation is we have to keep the system working. We have to make it prog progress. And yet we have a set of rules, requirements, other things that exist for us about how to do this, which when things go wrong will be used to, val to invalidate our performance. But when things go right, we'll be given the, the benefit or be given, given the, 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 so the uh, uh, be regarded as causing the performance. And you, you know that's not true. So, so this goes back to the thing where, like, periodically where I, I'll mention the end on court and I'll get sent a research paper that talks about how it failed in an oil company or something like that. And doesn't that really go back to embracing failure? And, and, and in the extreme case, at the edge, of course, like your heart surgery, but like the patient that gets the wrong needle um, by the by the nurse because the dietitian flipped the table and and because and I'm not saying this is easy, but because everybody's afraid to tell to to, to tell the truth because you might get fired. Completely where you create a same absolutely. thing with the end on cord, right? Com I've heard companies talk, talk about we could never do that completely because agree. if I stop this cabinet making line, I'm going to get fired because we got to produce you know. 4,000 a day. Yes, so. and, and, it's, and it's clear that um, one of the cases that will be in the Stella report is somebody who was deploying, doing what the, the worker thought was deploying to a test environment mm -hmm. and deployed to production. I know that's never happened to any of you. Yeah. <laughs> and the consequence, <laughs> the, the, uh, just, just offhand, has anybody ever had that happen? 
Okay. So, so <laughs> calibration, just great calibration for me. So what was interesting was that the deployment was to test a new version of things that was dependent upon a new version of the Apache web server. And um, the deployment was uh, picked up by the regular chef uh, thing that looks every 10 minutes to see and keep everything up to date, because God knows we've got to keep it all up to date. And it said, oh, new web server. <laughs> pushed it out there and started pushing it out to servers slowly because it's actually designed to do it over time. Okay. And, and, and of course what happened was this, the, uh, that version of Apache didn't work with what else was out there and those servers became inoperable. And so the performance of the system kind of started to slow down. And because this was happening in a staggered way, it was almost like the, that little, that little uh, thing there in the Jeopardy, doo, 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 <laughs> you know, because it's, it's going like this. And, but the point of this, of course, is that uh, y you know we we can learn from these things. And the person who brought this forward was the person who hit the button. They hit the button. They looked at it. They said, "Oops, I don't think that's right." And they immediately got on the war room channel. Said, "This is what I've done. This is what's going to happen. This is what what I think is going on." Let's g and and gathered around. And the website stayed up. It had a little poor performance for a while, but it did not go down. So the, now this goes back to your question. It, if you, can you create an environment where you can have an event occur where I myself push a button that causes the website to go down and I'm the person who realizes it and immediately says to everybody, this is what I've done, this is what's happened, let's get the resources together to fix that. Because that's quite different from yeah. the but way that this often happens. Wasn't that good. the Toyota culture, Mike? I mean, what, did I miss something in your book? Wait, wasn't that the Toyota culture? That it just, it kind of exuded that idea that like every time you kind of point out failure, it was a learning opportunity? Well, every, every time is a big word, oh, right. you know, and, and uh, Toyota, there's a wide range of variation, and there are crappy managers at Toyota, too. And, and, In the and, ideal. And employees complain about their yeah. workplace. So um, I think, <clears throat> you know, if you're going to watch the lean community for 20, 30 years, be part of it, make the same mistakes yourself. Um, certainly a key aspect of happy life, successful life, is acknowledging reality, uh, and, and reality is uncertainty, right? So good if we can acknowledge uncertainty. Um, you know, look up at night. The nearest one is really far away. We're, we're out here alone, and, and there's a lot of bubble gum and duct tape and bailing wire holding things together that you think are actually solid. Uh, you know, it could be that if we get too close to reality, you'd go crazy, right? It's possible, so careful. So if a key to is acknowledged the reality of uncertainty, uh, here's an idea for you. We need something to hang on to as humans. We gotta hang on to something. So if we're gonna let go of certainty, if we're gonna let go and say this plan is our best prediction of what's gonna happen, but we don't actually know what's gonna happen, you're taking a lot of that security away from people. You gotta give them something else to hang on to. And I have watched, myself included, in the earlier days, the lean community glom onto things like the and on cord, and that's certain. There it is. It looks like this. It works this way. This is how does Toyota do it? Tell me. I write it down. I take pictures. It's there are umpteen books that have and on cords or boards or whatever in the lean community, right? Uh, and, and there it is. So you hang on to that instead. Okay, crap's going to happen, but this is it. I got it. But of course, it's not true. It's just an artifact, right? So what we're messing around with is that if you're going to take away certainty from people and review them, lift up the lid and say, you know what, guys, it's all probabilities. You gotta give them something else. If you give them a meta skill, if you give them a way of dealing with uncertainty, it doesn't reduce uncertainty. It even doesn't, I think, reduce the fear. I still fear it. I, I encounter it and my first reaction is the stomach drop, like, oh, right? But my very next reaction is, I've seen this tree before. Not the uncertainty, but how to deal with it. I've dealt with this before, I'm a little more comfortable. So you let go of false certainty about and on cords, about plans. Yes, you make and on cords. Yes, you make plans or come up with other solutions. You let go of that a little bit and to compensate and keep you upright, you hang on instead to a psychological skill you've developed for dealing with it. You're giving up an illusion. Yeah. I mean, it's not, you're not giving up reality, you're giving up an illusion. The illusion of certainty, the illusion of control, those things are, are, are illusions, they're not real. I, I, 
And, and can I just confirm, kind of, <laughs> I, I want the conclusion that, that uh, you, you both asserted. I mean, I think that the trigger word, <laughs> the and on cord, right? I mean, uh, it, your concerns become ameliorated when we say, no, no, we mean and on cord, uh, we mean the notion that there's psychological safety, yeah. there's uh, permission to make yes. mistakes, and there is a prioritization about uh, improvement of daily work over daily work itself. Does but, that make that? But I think that's the difference in our world, right? Like we're not really stopping a line or we're not like, um, you know, there's two running out of fuel on a plane, right? I mean. I think there's multiple levels of this and, and we have to be careful about dealing with abstractions because in the abstract many things work and in the real world they, they, they are very difficult to produce. Um, in, in, uh, in many of the worlds that I work in where there's a, a tremendous risk and high regulation and lots of concern about safety, um, the, the work is actually very skilled and people are doing it very, very well. Big production, flying aircraft and commercial aviation is you know, an incredibly safe activity, but it's not safe by its inherent nature. It's safe because people are able to make it so that it is safe. And the way they do that is pretty well understood. I'm not saying very well understood, but pre they, they, the way they do it is very methodical and, and, and approached very well. By the way, there's a real interest in doing that in a lean fashion in the bad way. And there's lots of technological change that is going to make that much, much more difficult to accomplish in the future. But the, the key thing for me about this is that the people who are engaged in this activity are themselves actually fairly tuned in to what's going on. They really don't labor under any misapprehensions about the fact that those little dots on the radar screen are just little dots and I'm playing with them, moving them around like some Ender's Game story. Um, they're, they're very much aware of the weight of all this. The, the, the difficulty comes um, when they are put in a situation where they have to um, justify and, and explain why they do things this way and it becomes harder and harder. Now, in our space, when we're doing this stuff, when we're handling these kinds of environments, the, the kinds of skills and expertise that people have, they've acquired over a long period of time and they're very, very skilled at this stuff. They're actually very good. And it's pretty hard to improve substantially on what they're doing. You can make improvements, but the idea that you're going to make wholesale improvements is I think pretty much off the scale. But what we have is a group of managers who bought into, very often people quite distant from the sharp end, who bought into ideas that they've heard about, books that they've read, uh, uh, programs that they've attended, about how much better the world would be if we just do X. And they come home and they propagate X in their organization. And in organizations, we have the experience of having X and then Y and then Z appear at regular intervals. In some places, we call that the program of the month. You probably have heard about that. And so we're be, we, the, the working community has actually become fairly insulated against things like this. They are actually so familiar with the program of the month not connecting with the real world of work that they will give a nodding a, 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 a agreement and continue on with work as, as uh, they, they think it needs to be done. And I think that, that one of the problems that happened with Lean in particular is it became that kind of thin management <coughs> layer of talk and, and uh, uh, activity that was sort of layered on top of what was essentially a not changing workspace and people developed the language, they started talking about it, they used quality control mm -hmm. charts, they did this, they did that. But, but it didn't actually have a connection down into the deep substrata of real work. What Mike is talking about is trying to address that problem by trying to find ways to get, if I, I don't let me, stop me if I get this wrong, but trying to find ways to actually have that effect on real work and talking about the sharp end down here rather than a high level management program that trains a whole bunch of executives to come back and change the way things are going. And people can find their own way and their own solutions. And, and that's the key idea. And it's true about DevOps in general. And it's one of the reasons why DevOps is so hard to adopt and one of the reasons why DevOps has been so unsuccessful overall. I know. <laughs> I know. I do it just to shock. No, I don't. Um, 
which is that one of the consequences of DevOps, one of the, one of the key parts of DevOps, is that it involves not just the activities of people at the sharp end in a particular pattern, but also giving to those people authority and responsibility for a variety of things that are normally reserved for very high levels of management. And that is a big problem. So, and, and very, very <laughs> rarely is management willing to, to trust, build the structures that are necessary to have high confidence in those yeah. sharp end workers so, and their responsibility. I have just wanted to comment so, on it. DevOps being <laughs> unsuccessful. Yeah, I just kind of bristled. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I, 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 I had made the claim to both uh, Mike and uh, uh, Richard yesterday is that uh, what makes me so excited uh, is that I think all these um, theories that have been often in academia uh, have been sort of on, you know, very, very restricted to certain industries. I think that the first time that we're seeing them adopted at industrial scale is in our community. And so the notion of high trust leadership, the fact that uh, uh, these norms are being incorporated into the work that we do, right? And we've gone from lead times measured in, you know, one year to get into production to, to you know, uh, minutes or hours. I mean, that's uh, now 30%, according to the benchmark we've done, spanning 28,000 respondents, you know, 20 to 30 percent of organizations are actually hitting those type of, uh, you know, uh, are getting those kind of results. I think the other thing that's very hopeful to me is the people who are driving these sorts of transformations, you know, the rebellious um, uh, risk takers who are overcoming very powerful, entrenched incumbent systems, uh, now they're getting elevated and promoted. Um, you know, it's not just the Google's, Amazon, Facebook's, it is, you know, the largest brands in every industry vertical. So, you know, I actually have a much more hopeful thing. It's not just hope, it's based on data, right? We've been running the DevOps Enterprise Summit now for four years, and it is amazing to see what I would, you know, what I would call the elevation of the state of the workforce, you know, uh, that's going to touch 16 million engineers, right? Uh, so, you know, uh, I think this is why DevOps has been so successful. <laughs> So we see the opposite sides of the same coin, right? We're talking about the same coin, but we're turning it over. But, but let me just point out that I think that what Gene has said is, is, is actually correct, that the key thing here is not the technical competence of the workforce in a narrow sense, but rather the development of an environment, a kind of ethic, a kind of culture, mm -hmm. I'm reluctant to use that word, in which people who are practicing the way you practice are both aware of and engaged with the responsibility and authority for very important activities. And instead of just considering that you are an assembly line worker who if you fail in something, the car is going to be damaged or the paint's going to be scratched, you're seen as, and you accept the responsibility of a much more critical role in the functioning of things. And, and Mike, you know, just, uh, we're getting kind of near the end, yeah, but yeah. so one of the, the, Gene has created this thing with the DevOps Enterprise Summit, and if you, and we have uh, somebody who's actually in our books, plug for our book, but Courtney Kisser, and, and she's done incredible things at Nordstrom, and she, she, Toyota Kata is kind of her Kata. Mm -hmm. uh, your book, she's gone to KataCon, and Courtney. so uh, a lot of, and, and one of the things, when you ask a lot of people who have been successful um, of in, in fact, two things. A lot of people you ask successful people who have come to our Enterprise Summit, a couple of things they'll say. One is, yeah, I talked to Courtney <laughs> and right. she helped mentor. But the other thing is value stream mapping, which is the other thing that you haven't mentioned a whole lot, but your learning to see book, mm. it has been incredibly influential yeah, well, in the DevOps community for oh, value okay. stream mapping. Wow. So, yes, it, it, yeah. Yeah, I didn't know if you were aware of that. I mean, if I, if I interview like 10 people that if you looked at the 48 case studies in our book, mm. um, I would say probably about 15 of those would say we started off with value stream mapping. Yeah, and I can't really say this because I have a different publisher for it, but the Toyota Kata Culture book, the orange one, mm -hmm. there's a reason it looks the same format-wise as Learning to See. It's the follow-on to oh, Learning oh, to See. Because Learning to See is like 17 years old now. Yeah. And the question, okay, you've got a future state map. You've got a picture of where you'd like to go. Okay, now what do you do, right? And, and that's what we've been messing around with the last 10 years or so. Um, yeah, we're close, right, time-wise? Um, okay. Um, look, Gene, I like what you said, you know, the needle's moving, right? But change, maybe our brains are changing. We're, there's a process of change going on in humans. Of course there is, there always is. It doesn't care about our lifespan. Our lifespan is not the yardstick. If you were a stone and you existed for 200 years, probably you'd see the change moving, you know? And, and 
each one of our lifetimes, it may just change slightly incrementally. But, you know, John, you said, and everybody says it, embrace mistakes to me is still a marker of uh, a kind of thinking, it's an oxymoron. You know, mistakes is a, an embrace mistakes. No, I don't want to embrace mistakes. And if my airway is not good and, and this doesn't work, I'm not going to embrace that. Screw that. Um, you know, <clears throat> it, it is more understanding the role of uncertainty in our living which would then lead us to developing the coolest solutions. And right now, business schools teach planning. I don't think they teach a very good iteration approach. And if you teach a good planning approach, you're only teaching half the deal. So I'm watching you know, business schools to see, are they going to start teaching iteration approaches, which is the other side of the coin? Uh, let me just demonstrate for you briefly. It's remarkable. Um, it's a bit of the universe right here, OK? Um, just give me a sec. It, it's not hard. Um, did you see it? I'll do it again. You might have missed it. So, all right. It's just astonishing. So I'm standing here. My neurons are preparing to take a step. Okay. Um, and they've got a plan for how to take that step. But while I take the step, a thousand things happen. The carpet's softer here than I thought. There's a breeze. You distracted me. I had a thought. A thousand things happen, and those neurons adjust. They make a prediction, so to speak. They make a prediction, and they quickly adjust. And it is the adjustment that lets me complete the step and stay upright. It is not the plan to take a step. It is the adjustments that my neurons make while I'm taking the step. Now, let's go back a few million years. Some fish stood up. Maybe he got slapped up by a hurricane or something. He's t teetering, but his neurons are way too slow. You know, they can't adjust quick enough. It flops back down, right? Uh, but there's some mutation somewhere along the line. I'm making this up. There's some mutation along the line. There's this fish, and he's got faster neurons, right? And he stays up longer, right? And a female fish sees him and says, oh, I want to meet with him. And then, you know, that happens. And then so that, but you see what I'm saying? It is the role of uncertainty, the important role of uncertainty in our life, it is the adjustments to the uncertainty that allow me to complete the step, not the plan. And I don't think we're there yet. And I think if we say embrace mistakes, if we say, I'm going to use uncertainty to achieve what I want to achieve, uh, then we're getting closer to where Toyota is with the end. Sounds like good money. Oh, well, man, <laughs> if I may rebut or uh, provide an alternate viewpoint, I mean, I think one of the things that we were actually talking about yesterday, uh, there's a, one of my favorite books is uh, The Scientific Structure of, no, Structure of Scientific Cyber Revolution Scientific. Yeah. by Dr. Thomas, Thomas Kuhn. Yeah. And that's actually where the term inflection point is. And I think, well, the, I think it's relevant because what Kuhn asserted was that, you know, in any revolution, whether it's Copernican to Newtonian, I'm sorry, Copernican to Ein Newtonian, Newtonian to Einsteinian, right? Uh, it, there's this inflection point, is what the term with that he coined, and uh, it looks like it was a overnight shift. Right. right? But, but you know, uh, he, he made it uh, the comparison to sublimation. Right? It went from air, gas, to solid instantaneously. But if you zoom in on that period, you know, there was a whole bunch of players in that time. You know, that were working on it. It wasn't just Einstein. It was uh, yeah, Shrenkoff and so forth. Yeah. Right? It's everyone here. Yeah. Um, but you know, uh, something happens, and it went from. Newtonian to Einsteinian, right? Um, on the grand scheme of things, almost overnight. And I think, you know, uh, the, the phase shift that you're looking for is going to happen within, you know, it, our lifetime. It's underway. It's, it's underway, lifetime. absolutely. It's underway. And my firm now. belief is it's going to happen in this community here. There's no place where technology can be used to spread ideas faster, incorporate new ideas faster, to have bravery and courage to, like, uh, uh, implement these radical practices. Um, uh, so, you know, I'm actually relentlessly optimistic that, okay. uh, yeah, that, that that's it's good. actually going to be in this community. I think we're, uh, are we? Can I have one minute? You asked that gentleman in the orange two, shirt. Two, <laughs> two minutes. It'll, it'll be shorter than that. Um, I, I, when I put up, one of the slides I put up yesterday was the curse of DevOps, and I think you ought to think very carefully about the very cur various curses of DevOps that you are going to inherit. If people take you seriously and they give you both the tools and the opportunity to make systems in the way that you would like to make them, with that will come, whether or not you like it, responsibility for those systems. And that responsibility is becoming more and more a part of the human fabric. It was a technical thing for a while about this getting, you know, 
little cat gifts to show up, but now it turns out that Twitter is as important to operations of revolutions as it is uh, uh, to uh, uh, posting a cat oh, gift. Lectures. And I want, <laughs> I want you, the, the, the message I'm trying to get across is a very simple one, which is that as you go through this, you will be taking on a greater and greater burden of, of acting in an ethical and responsible way in the systems that you are building because they are important systems and they will grow in importance. And I think that conversation is something that is yet to be had about how we build a kind of ethical framework mm -hmm. for the work that we are doing mm -hmm. so that the things that we are doing are actually productive for the society in which we live. Mm -hmm. I think that the recent experiences um, in the tech industry tell us that this is a crucial discussion and I would invite you to start talking about that today.